So this is just going to be a, a rambly uh, response to Jack's video, Atheist's Clever Game. Um, if you all don't know Jack, it's Together for Peace, link in the description box. Um, a, a while ago on, on my channel, I started calling people... Dark Lord Apologists. And uh, my definition for this might differ from uh, anybody else's definition for this. I don't think that uh, uh, most of the people who are Dark Lord Apologists, in my opinion, will accept that term. It's kind of pejorative. Um, Justin at uh, Questioning Christ, he he loves the term. He made a video just ecstatic that I would call him such a thing, you know. And it is kind of based on the uh, Star Wars mythos. Um, but, but in my mind, there are people who have an end goal of not the truth. Their end goal is you will believe in the Jesus, or whatever religion they are uh, serving. That's the end goal. Not the truth. The truth is separate from this. This is, you will believe in the Jesus. Now, how much of the truth overlaps, you will believe in the Jesus, I, I really don't know. You know, I don't think that uh, we'll ever really know. Uh, by the the end of our lives, and dying is probably the quickest way to figure that shit out. But, <sighs> being that, the truth is not the end game, and it's obvious with the amount of uh, arguments from the same direction that some apologists will use, sometimes you get really defensive with these apologists. And you don't even want to admit the path that you took to get to the place where you are. Because you think that maybe these people will twist uh, part of your path and, and, and you know maybe use some wordplay and shoehorn some Jesus beliefs in there. I, I say Jesus beliefs because I'm, I'm responding to Together for Peace, but it could be any sort of religious thought. And and it puts you on guard. Because, again, the end goal is not truth. It is Jesus. And these people kind of consider that the truth and Jesus are the same thing. But, I don't. Now, uh... Jack has a problem with, uh, you know, the different types of definitions that people have for atheism, and that some of these definitions seem to be preemptively arguing the atheist position, you know, from apologetics. And the the definition that I have come to uh, was has it's been especially changed by my experience on YouTube. I share the same definition of Edward Tart and a few other uh, more learned atheists who've, who've read up on it and uh, have encountered Dark Lord apologists. Apologists who don't really care about the truth and they, they know different levels of atheism. They know those who have become atheists by faith. They know people who have become atheist by skepticism, you know, they know the different tiers of, of thought here. You know, they read uh, philosophy books, not to have a conversation with people to, you know, maybe come to a greater truth between the two of you. No, they come to bring you to the Jeebus. So this definition that Edward Tart uh, was the first person I heard espouse. It goes like this. 
An atheist is simply someone who finds no credible evidence in the existence of a deity. And there's many points to that that you can break down. Um, the word finding in that means, well, it means implicitly that someone was looking, right? This is someone who found no credible evidence in the existence of a deity. It's someone who's finding no evidence. So, there, there's implied a search. This is different from the bionic dance definition in that trees don't become atheists. Babies really don't become atheists, right? So, the next point in, in this definition uh, would be the word credible. And this is very important to what Jack was saying, because when we say we, f we found no credible evidence in the existence of a deity, there, there's many different forms of evidence. And there are some people here on YouTube who will say, and not really understand what they're saying, that personal experience does not constitute evidence. Now, even if we were just to use, you know, scientific evidence, yes, you can use personal uh, personal testimony and, and stuff as scientific evidence in certain ways. Um, of the different tiers of evidence you know there there are weighted categories okay the highest most trusted form of evidence would be something that you can verify and something that you can repeat you know that's great evidence personal experience not so good you know it's not really fit for conveying to other people as a fact that could happen to them. You know, uh, it's great. Anecdotal evidence is used very often in trying to convey the truth. But if you're trying to get to hard facts, then you're, you're wanting to go for verifiability, repeatability, you know, um, observations that couldn't have been skewed by your own personal bias whereas you know personal experience it's it doesn't have that much weight to it um, and some people when they're when they're talking about evidence they will draw a line and they will say anything short of scientific evidence is where we are, are cutting off anything for explaining or conveying any sort of truth, right? And it's very uh, obvious that uh, in, in many religious conversations, the theists are accepting personal revelation and, and personal experiences. And they're also accepting, you know, this little thing called faith which, you know, definitionally will be different to us. You know, many of us would consider faith to be believing in the lack of uh, the existence of evidence. But some of these theists believe that faith is some sort of magical uh, information beamed down from the sky that uh, allows them, you know, special powers to see things that we don't this this faith thing however they define this faith it's not the same as uh most of the the people on the atheist side so what i'm saying here is it, it's on on the scale of the weight that you should put on evidence you know from the atheist side i'm, I'm saying it's it's at the bottom of the the barrel it's it's the smallest sort of thing that you should consider if you're trying to uh, postulate what the truth is and then confer it to some other people, you know. But it exists. 
and its existence is something that some atheists will completely uh, dismiss, but it, it is a pillar upon which many people have built their personal belief structure, and it's sometimes insulting to them when they have built a house on, you know, partially some evidence that you could uh, verify and repeat, and partially some personal experience, and partially some faith. You know, those those pillars. And there's other pillars in the world, such as history. Um, recorded history has problems to it, and uh, anything before the 1600s, before the Enlightenment, you can say had a certain bent to it, and uh, basically anything before the 1600s, if there was any truth to it, it's already been restated in some book that you can find after the 1600s, and it's been restated in a way that the, the evidence is more sound for whatever truth it's trying to convey. But history is is one of these other pillars. When when uh, apologetics will will talk about the historicity of Jesus, you know that's one of those pillars that they've built their beliefs on, you know. And there are many atheists who try to eliminate as many of the other pillars for for building their their framework for their beliefs as possible. And they see this as a noble goal. And they try to grow the pillar of uh, verifiable and repeatable evidence to basically stand their entire framework on that one pillar. Right? And I would say that's that's good if you are talking to other people, but when you're you know, by yourself, and you're you're having to recount all the, the experiences in your life, you're not a robot, and you probably had some of these other pillars propping up some of your beliefs, um, no matter what you did. Even Hitchens had some of these other things. Um, and so you can try to target your, your fight against these other pillars, and... and trying to make these pillars smaller by saying uh, we're just going to try to eliminate the ones that, that cause bigoted laws to be created. You know, we're going to try to make sure that we're not being oppressed, you know, by, by beliefs that are propped up by these other pillars. But in the end, uh, it's, it's kind of like uh, an algorithm. You're never going to get to absolute zero. Um, you can try to eliminate 99.999% of all that type of belief, type of uh, constructing what reality is, but you're still probably going to be left with uh, a few things that uh, you just can't get rid of. You know, when, when, when you finally get in your uh, reading to just uh, Descartes saying, I, I think, therefore I am, you know, you'll realize that's, that's a pretty, uh, it's, it's a pretty basic building block. You know, you can't really eliminate that without really getting s some uh, convoluted and, and high-level philosophy in there. And you, you'd you probably spend the better part of your life reading all of those philosophy books if you got to the point where you thought that none of your reality rested on that Descartian principle. You know? <sighs> Anyways, um, as far as the other points in, in it, uh, finding no credible evidence in the existence of a deity. Uh, we use the existence of a deity instead of uh, God proper with a capital G in, in the sentence because th these are things that 
Dark Lord apologists will use to shoehorn in an argument to get their foot in the door. Um, the reason for you know finding no instead of lacking, uh, many people will use the definition that they lack a belief in a god or gods. You know, if you use that definition, you should be prepared to at some point encounter a Dark Lord apologist who will use the argument that there's a hole in your heart that cannot be filled with anything but the Jesus. And it's evident in the way that you define your own position because you say you are lacking something. They will use language and say that that lack implies that you need, that there is a missing something, right? So the definition put forth by me is actually it's a result of all of these different sometimes horrible arguments by dark lord apologists sometimes i i, I don't even think that they take themselves seriously they see the end goal of bringing you to the jesus as being more important than getting to truth you know and, and if you ever came across that argument, you'd probably, uh, most assuredly, uh, be dealing with a, an apologist who's just testing the waters to see how far advanced you have gotten in your studies of philosophy and yourself. And let's see. Another thing I want to uh, say here is that since coming to YouTube, I've come to a, another fervent belief. Um, I might have believed this on some level before, you know, three years ago, but in the time I've been here on, on YouTube, I have learned that the people who you should respect as far as what their definition of themselves is, is those people. Um, for instance... When someone says that they're a Christian and then they do something bad, you can't just say that they're not a Christian anymore, you know? Um, they're just failing at being a Christian, but you don't call them not a Christian. You don't commit the no true Scotsman fallacy and say that anyone who is a Christian wouldn't do this or say this, okay? Anyone who who is a Christian wouldn't believe in this certain way. The only way that I will ever call someone a Christian anymore is based on them saying that they are a Christian. You know? Uh, you don't say that somebody's not a Christian if they're saying that they are one. Um, and whatever definitions they come up with, if you are intolerant of that definition, um, it, it's the, the quick path to bigotry. It really is. So, trying to impose your own definition on another people that, that are different than you, you know, if you just look up the term bigotry and then just think about all of the different implications when you've got one belief of how it should be and how if they say that they are this way that they they should be this way if you try to impose that on other people um at some point you are going to be exhibiting bigotry so if someone says they're an atheist i think you should accept that you know and accept whatever way that they believe that uh, one can come up, come by atheism, and apply it to themselves. You know, if you don't accept that, then you are intolerant of, you know, possibly a large culture, but maybe the culture of one. But still, being intolerant of a culture of one is, it's, it's bigotry. So, I don't do it. Now, 
for those of you who are in my viewing audience, um, those maybe a hundred out of the the 1500 I've got, for those of you who consider yourselves well learned in all of this, I would recommend watching Together for Pieces video, Atheist's Clever Game, and then watching Theo Warner's videos attacking Bionic Dance, because although some of my friends have expressed that uh, they don't like Jack for uh, being stuck in definitional games, in his video he's actually uh, wanting to get past that, and... If you look at the two completely separate directions that they're coming from, I think you'll see that there is a darker Dark Lord apologist here. You know? I think that uh, understanding the, the path of atheism that some atheists take is only used sometimes in order to shoehorn in these ideas... Um, and use a whole bunch of wordplay in order to get you to finally relent and go to church. So uh, check both those guys out.